Oh my, it's Kelly White. Hey, it's James Grand Pog. What are you up to? Thinking about changing the world. Uh, me too. We should do a show together. What would it be about? Let me show you. Show. Oh, it's Kelly White. Hey, it's Kelly White. <laughs> Hi, honey. How are you today? Good, honey. How are you in the Midwest? Well, believe it or not, it's 79 degrees here today. Amazing. And it snowed like what, two days ago there was snow or yeah. three days yeah. ago? Yeah, yeah. It, it's a crazy, but it's so pleasant and wonderful to have this. And especially tonight's a very auspicious night. Yes, tell everybody, welcome everybody. And this is a very special time. You texted me about 11, right after my soul care today. And you, and I didn't, I knew there was a full moon coming around here, but I didn't know what it was. So you texted. Tonight is a super moon, which is a rare thing, which means it's as close to earth as they come. Only 7% of full moons are super moons, but it's a pink moon. What does that mean? You I'm going to tell there. you. Okay, this is really funny, but according to the Farmer's Almanac, of by the way, of which I read now, I am not kidding you. Oh, yeah. I read it now. I didn't even know what it was. Now it's like I, I read it. Um, it's about moss pink flowers that grow in the spring, and that's how they call this the pink moon. Moss pink flowers. Now, you're a gardener. I so know. Look, this, look up. this up. Moss pink flowers. Now, what's interesting about a pink moon, because it is very rare, a pink moon means changes, progress, fertility. It means manifesting your dreams. Okay, this is all good. Adaptability, setting your goals. So that's all what the pink moon is. Now, let's add the full moon, shall we, in... Scorpio. Scorpio. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. So Scorpio, as we know, is very intense. And a full moon is normally very intense. And you add Scorpio to that. And tonight is going to be, well, you would have felt it the last couple, two or three days, right? Definitely. I mean, and last going night, forward. Last night, last night I felt it very, very much so. Very strongly. So Scorpio is intense. It means death and transformation, actually. I mean, bottom line is... Um, it's in deep emotions. And this full moon, believe it or not, is opposing Uranus, which is not a good thing. Uranus is, you know, the planet of surprise. And it squares, which is like a squaring off of Saturn. And Saturn is the old ways. It doesn't want to be karma. screwed with. It's karma. Uh, it sounds like old relationships are going to, relations are going to start changing. So, uh, Absolutely, James. This is a potent time for transformation in relationships and in finding a job. Let's say your job doesn't work any longer. Believe me, you're going to find something else. It means, too, also to be rebellious. It's got a rebellious attitude about this one. And also, at, so it means this. It means you want to trust yourself to change and grow. That's what we're doing now. Trusting yourself to change and grow and be willing to adapt and redirect your energy. Okay, oh, so re you can do what you planned on doing when you incarnated. This is going to be a big time for growth for that. Now, at the same time, I just want to mention that Mars is in Cancer for the next six mm. weeks. Mm. Now, Mars is aggressive. It's intense. It's a planet of war. It fire. hates Cancer. <laughs> Cancer's the mother, cancer the moon. I mean, it's... Water. It's water, it's, you know, it's sentimental. So for the next six weeks, emotions are going to be like uh, kind of intense. Um, but anyway, right now, the other good thing here is at the same time, Venus is traveling in its own sign of Taurus. And that's going to bring us self-worth. So even though you're going to be making some changes, you're going to feel good eventually of making these changes. Go ahead and make these changes. It's time to ch It's time for that. Now, let me tell you, the last thing I want to mention is what this moon is good for tonight, okay? So okay. this is a great time if you want to do a liver cleanse or a detox. It's great for that. It's okay. great for getting into 
because it's Scorpio, the can hidden. Can I start tomorrow to do the, the uh, detox? Yeah, you can start tomorrow. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, and it's a great time because it's in Scorpio to look at your hidden side, look at your shadow, shadow side. So you want to look at the shadow and you want to, you know, really allow yourself, to, if whatever issues you have, just Without be judgment. honest. Judgment. No judgment. Just be honest with yourself. So it's time to let go of anything that's been holding you back. A great thing to do this time is to listen to music that will trigger happy emotions because what you want to do is set this stage up for you to have gratitude and to be happy and to feel good about things in the middle of change. Okay. So set that up. It's a great time to cleanse your crystals and set the intention of your crystals to adapt to change and to, if you're going to do a detox, you know, give it that inf that love that it needs. So set the intention that you want during this time for your crystals. Kelly, excuse me one second. And so the crystal, if you put it, you put them outside, correct? Put them out in the moon. Yes. And for how long do you keep them out there? Just one I night do it or? overnight. I just do overnight. it overnight. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll do that later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I have so many big ones, but I'm, the smaller ones that I use daily, I put out uh, during this and, time. And the moon gravitational pull will take out the toxins and bring in yes. the light. Yes. Okay. It cleanses, and you're setting the stage for your crystals. You're actually telling the crystals what you need them to do, you know, so it's a really good thing. And the the last thing that I always suggest is take a bowl of water and set it outside and put your intentions into the water. Because if you want to start a detox program or let go of a relationship, set that intention in this water. It's so powerful right now. You can feel the energy and then drink the water, put a, put it in your bath, water your plants. I did that with the last one. I did it two days ago and I told you I had it and I watered my plants and the plants were like going crazy. And that particular plant, seriously. I love it. I love it. There's a lot of things we can do. So enjoy this big moon. So tonight we have a really interesting subject. And I want to break it down in four ways of, because we have two guests that are going to come on and talk about it. James is going to start and he's going to talk about completion of suicide, the souls that have completed it. We say now completed. I got in big trouble for saying committed, and I will not make that mistake again. I'll try not to make that mistake. It's not a crime. So it's a completion of it. So James is going to talk about it from the soul standpoint. I'm going to talk about it for the family and friends that remain. And then our guest, Dr. Shirley Impelizari, is going to talk about it from her point of view. And then we have another guest, uh, Carrie Gonia, who's going to talk about it from her point of view, a family constellation so it's going to be a fascinating program mm -hmm. um, I, and the number one question i'm always asked about for the past 40 years is suicide what happens to suicide um do they go to hell are they lost forever are they earthbound yes. and and i admit as everyone i made i when i didn't know enough when i first was my first book talking to heaven i wrote a chapter on suicide and at that point in my time, my, my life, my career. I didn't know enough about it and I didn't put it in accurately. I used my Catholic background, which was not good because it was a bias. And I recognized that and I wish I could reprint it, but I, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts have changed as they do. Our, th our thoughts because of experience we have changed over the years. And mine has changed over suicide because number one, I would say um, we are souls having an experience. So uh, when someone goes, no matter how they go, the soul is released, the soul is free. They're not, they don't just disappear, they're not dead. There's no such thing as death, you can't kill energy. And sometimes it doesn't matter how you leave the body because you usually don't feel it when you leave the body anyway. But you means they're caught up in how you die, but it's very easy, it's like to breath in and breath out. So suicide has changed over the many, many years that I've worked, um, depending on the situation itself. So a suicide, like many things in life, uh, there's really intention behind the act. So if somebody uh, completed suicide, whose Google stock went down and they jump out the window, um, that's very different than somebody who had a mental illness. It would be handled very differently. And uh, the most important thing to re realize and re know is that the spirit world always know what's happening. They're not in time, they're outside of time. So they're very, very aware that that soul will be coming over. And there are really rescue souls, if you want to call them that, whose job it is, whose mission it is, is to help those new soul, arriving souls who have left that way. And to really bring them for example, to a clearinghouse, a hospital, a, a, a place of counseling. And, and depending again on this type of suicide it was, um, if it was an emotional upset, um, then that's handled a different way. They, they clear the mind of the situation. I've had many suicides in my life, in my family actually. And uh, so it's interesting. And, um, 
Hmm. Uh, number one, we come back for a certain time. Our soul comes back to learn lessons and we come back for some lessons that will take mm, 10 years. Maybe a lesson is to go through birth and you're done. Maybe a lesson is to live 20 years and go by an accident. Maybe 40 years, maybe 90 years. We cannot base it on human time. It's on the soul experience. So maybe the soul only needs a certain time. Um, so it's a school. It's classes we take is to learn to expand the soul, our awareness, our wisdom. Now, I always say it's never um, good to cut school because we always have to learn various lessons. And we find that before we come back into this incarnation, we really gather with our, our, our wise guides and teachers and spiritual uh, teachers, if you will, and we go through our soul's plan and we go through a kind of a curriculum that we will learn and go through in this wonderful time we've had this, really we've been given this gift of life here because there's a gift. And, and it's a time with the other souls that you know, that you're united, you're connected with your soul group those friends and family members who you've been through many lifetimes before and you take on different roles such as a mother or a grandmother or a best friend or a partner you take on these different roles each lifetime to learn different aspects of the relationship of the soul aspects of love um how to live through life how to believe in ourselves how to get through many things in this, in this physical dimension um hard dimension because it's not a real place it's a hard place to be and I, I, so i think we're always giving a choice i think so I have many, many beliefs about this, but I do believe there are many hmm, ways about this of suicide. Um, someone who pleads suicide when they're 80 years old and they live a full life, but they have a disease that's going to just um, get senility or dementia um, and they want to let themselves go. I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. They live their life. It's okay to go. And they, there's no quality of life. I, I believe when there's no quality of life personally, when there's no quality of life, it's okay to go. A friend of mine did that actually. And she said, uh, first thing she said was, uh, she came back the day she did it, because we had an agreement to come back to each other. And she said, um, I said, but what did you find yourself when you went there? Did you find, she goes, oh my God. She goes, if I knew how great it was, I would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> she said, uh, no, it was, it was, it was a courage for me to do it. I completed most of my life there. I didn't really have to learn it much more. And um, uh, so it was good in her respect. But someone who's, you know, just 20 years old and has a, a date that doesn't, doesn't show up and they go out and do that. It's a different situation. And, and, and sometimes there are suicides and, and surely you back to surely be able to talk about some more, but I think there are, there are sometimes where there are suicides just want to end the emotional pain and they think that'll be it. They'll be gone. It'll be finished. Um, I, I remember there was a lady that came to me as a client from South Africa many, many years ago when I was living in LA doing readings and she sat in my, my room and uh, I did this reading and this young man, Peter came through. His name was Peter. He was 23, big tall guy. And he actually brought me to an experience I never had. I became him. And he went up into this tree and he hung himself in a tree and he popped out of the top of his head. He was very, he wanted to get out of the pain. And he popped out the top of his head and he was fully conscious. And he said, oh my God, what have I done? And the first thing he said was, what is my mother gonna say when she finds me? Oh my God, the people left behind. And Kelly, you're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but it's many of the people left behind. Um, my brother-in-law also suicided um, because it was, again, an emotional problem or there was some addiction problem or something going on there. Um, a lot of emotional stirring up. Um, and he did also come through and he felt, um, he had to work a little bit on self-love. He didn't have enough, didn't have enough self-love. He, he had to work on himself with self-love. And, um, and then he was really worried about the family left behind. Um, but I want to say something, too, because people always think suicide, that's it. That's the, the worst thing. A soul can never be harmed. You can have a harm a soul. A soul will not go to hell and burn. There's no such thing. I mean, you will not be harmed. Somebody asked me the other day if I saw Dreams May Come and with uh, Robin Williams. I did see a little bit of it. I didn't see all of it because they didn't handle suicide the right way. And two of the producers came to me as a, to consult with me when they wrote that been many many years ago and i did tell them about the vividness and what spirit world looked like and they captured that but they didn't capture suicide but they, they portrayed someone as lost they're never lost never 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 and the best thing you do for a suicide person is just send them love because if they chose to leave that way and they and the spur of the moment let's say um and they they're, they're so sorry but they left behind with the people but you just have to help them heal that send them love because if you're sending them love they feel it and they know it and that'll help them to love themselves mm because you love them. So it's a good thing to do. And, and I just I, I just say that, again, no one can be hurt. I, I'm sorry, that will that repeat a life? You know, it depends. I, I don't know if before lifetime planning that the soul group got together with the guides and and in the group, one of them, just, you know, they all had to go through experience of suicide once when leaving early. And one of them might have volunteered and said, you know what, uh, for me to grow spiritually, I will complete that. And so you can all learn about what it's like, for, you know, from that point of view. 
So maybe that was destined to happen. I'm not going to say absolutely say, no, it can't be that way. It might. It's a possibility. You won't know until we press over, but it's a probability. So there's many things, but the most important is that we can never be harmed, never be hurt. And um, please send them love if they, they do. I, I, again, um, that's, all, that's all I can say. That's all I can yeah. say. No, I mean, you said that so beautifully, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk about the survivors of the families yeah, because I have to deal, I deal a lot like you do, James, with both yeah. sides. I mean, from the, the person who's, who was in so much pain that they completed a, a suicide um, or, and also the family members that come to me for readings. And so what I've learned about the ones that are left behind, and so this will affect a lot of people that have been touched by suicide, for them, the people that are left behind, it's a mystery often, they're devastated, they're shattered, uh, they may feel like they've lost their mind, uh, they feel isolated, they're terrified, traumatized, hugely traumatized, they're alone, they're usually in shock, they feel guilt, Guilt. Their guilt is a huge one. They feel yeah. bewildered. They feel despaired. They're heartbroken. So there's a lot of trauma. And, and that also, I could have them. saved them. I tell you that also, right? I could have saved them. What oh, could I have done to have I hear this them? one all the time. I, I could have saved them if only I hadn't gone to the store. If only I had gone and picked up the phone. If only it's, I, I hear this probably every single day. And what happens with this is people, um, the survivors have a, post-traumatic stress disorder. They'll have a PTSD, they'll have emotional, um, em enormous guilt, intrusive thoughts, panic attacks. They're gonna feel often shocked. Uh, they may have nightmares, they may startle easily, they may avoid people. And also on top of that, you may feel the ones that are survived, abandoned, feel shame. You may feel rage, you may feel anger. It's a complicated grief. This is not a normal way to die. So it is a complicated grief. And so you have to work with continued bitterness and anger and sadness and all of the questions. And then you have to wonder, you have to ask yourself and be really honest, do you have those suicidal thoughts? Because that's going to be very important. And there's a really interesting place that you can look up. It's called the American Association of Suicidology. The American Association of Suicidology. And you may find some really interesting things but um, about this because your thought might be you might want to join your loved one. And that's and not I'll the thing to do. You by, by saying also, you should never be embarrassed to ask for help. Right. Absolutely. If you, suicide, and you can think of those thoughts, ask for help. And one of the, absolutely. And one of the things that I really want to talk about here is definitely if you are a survivor of this, you want to seek out survivor other survivors you want to know other other people that have gone through this you want to go to a support group you want to surround your people with yourself with people who you feel very comfortable with um, you have to accept that things have changed that was who you were before and then who you are now after this okay um, you definitely need to seek a therapist that understands suicide uh, possibly a medium that specializes in it or that understands it because that's a big one right there. Um, and uh, you have to take care of yourself. You have to remember to eat and sleep and you still have to remember to take care of yourself. And just remember, as James said, nobody goes to hell. There's no such thing. Okay. Nobody goes to hell here. And we also, if anybody is thinking about this or if they have family members, because once that door opens and Shirley's going to talk about that, once that door opens to suicide, it opens kind of an energetic door for other family members. In fact, Carrie, when we talk, when Carrie's on in a few minutes, and we're going to talk to her about that too. Um, but there is a suicide hotline number. Renee, would you put that suicide hot? There you go. Right. The National right. Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So if you or somebody else that you know, you know, has are contemplating this, please, please, please um, call that number. Okay. Because Definitely. It, won't be, uh, it won't be just uh, roses when you pass. So it's, it's going to, you know, for many people, yes. it's going to be, wow, a lot what I leave behind. What I had so much opportunity. Look what well, I could have Let's talk had. about that. Yes. Well, yes. So far, I've seen the spirit would say, would they show me things, say, I left early and my, before my time. And um, it's interesting. Sometimes I say, I've come in before my time. I rushed back in the lifetime before it was really my time. I wanted to come back and finish things, but they were out of sync, which is interesting. Wow. Um, but they say sometimes when they leave, not, not everybody, this is, again, individual cases. And they'd show me, they said, these, these are the opportunities I had, which I stayed on earth. 
I would have had the love life. I would have had this house. I would have had this incredible job. I would travel. All these things were going to happen to them, but they didn't take the time to be here and see that. If they just loved themselves a bit more, you know, didn't listen to people, love themselves. Right. What other people think of you is none of your business. It doesn't define who you are at all. And be true to yourself. And there's always help. You're not alone. No one is ever alone. Whether you think physically, you're never alone. You have a phone there. And the spirit is always with you, but no one's ever alone. I mean, I, the guy of Kelly, like she's oh. on my bad phone. I was talking all the day. So we're never alone. You know? Never really. alone. So, so let's bring Shirley on. Should we bring Dr. Please. Shirley in? Shirley, well, are you ready? To? What's her background? So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Shirley. Shirley and I have worked together for many years. She's a psychologist uh, in Beverly Hills for, I don't know, at least 20 years, she wrote a book called Why, Why Can't, Can't I Change? It's a great book. It's a great book. <laughs> I just picked it up a book stuff left and I know who is it. What a great title. And it was Shirley's. It was Shirley. And Shirley specializes great. in somatic experience. So you know how I'm always, James and I are always talking about, you know, somatic of the body, trauma that's stored in the body. This is Shirley. So Shirley, welcome, Dr. Shirley and Pelizzeri. Yay! Yay. Aren't you so gorgeous? Yay! Oh my God, I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Cheryl. Welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> you guys have been doing an incredible job. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Thanks. so happy to join you guys, though, tonight. This is so fun. Yay! I mean, the topic is a tough one, right? Yeah. 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 But, um, but where do it's you stand on all of it? You know, I mean, I really love what both of you have said, but James in particular, what you said about, you know, no judgments. You know, it's so hard if you haven't lived in someone's shoes, and I know that's a cliche saying, but it's so true. We don't know what someone is going through. And it's very easy to say, you know, to maybe have a thought or a judgment or a criticism with someone. And it's... We, we need to understand that they are in so much pain that many times suicide is just to alleviate the emotional pain. And if you have never been in that pain or had ever a suicidal thought, then you can't relate to how they felt, you know? So it's, it's just, as you said, James, or both of you said to just send them love, you know, it's, it's such a difficult thing to try and understand. Yeah, Shirley, I, I, let's just, if you, let me interrupt for one second. I went to, when I was into therapy, and um, it was one of the greatest things. I love therapy. And uh, the, the, I ended up doing the therapy to the therapist, but that's okay. But she said to me something which I thought really, really stuck with me. She said, listen, everybody has their own reality. So what's your reality and your partner's reality are two different realities, and you got to respect people's reality. Everyone's reality is very different. So you can't yeah, impose yeah. your reality on that other person. So same exactly, thing. Exactly, exactly. And there's so many other factors, you know, um, even looking at, uh, at COVID, you know, we all thought that maybe the incidence of suicide had, had risen and they mm -hmm. haven't. The reason shows that they haven't, that doesn't mean that there aren't more people on the brink or there are more people thinking about it. And it has, it, there's so many other factors involved, you know, as I think Kelly, you said, it's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if you feel lonely, you know, when, when you both were saying you're never alone, I mean, yeah. I have to, and I'm very open with my with my past and my troubles that I attempted when I was 15, because you, you, yeah, those yeah, sort of 15, yeah, right, because I felt so I was taken to live to another country and I couldn't, I didn't have anyone to connect to, and felt no one could see me or hear me or understand me. And at the core, at the core of attachment is to feel seen by someone, to feel understood by someone. And so it, it, there's so many different factors involved. Uh, I, I was going to do it two years ago when I had, when I had my divorce, when I broke up. Yeah. I mean, I got to a place in a parking lot. And I said, what am I living for? There's nothing living for anymore. And all this stuff is running your head. And I just had nothing to live for. And it was like, but then, of course, I got back into my body again. But you, you're at the end. You're like a wall. You hit a wall. It's like, what? You know, but I know better. But it was just, I understand it. Right, right. You hit a wall and you think that, one, that's your only option. Two, that's the only option that's going to stop the incredible pain. And something about pain is physical pain and emotional pain run on the same circuitry in the brain. That's why people get addicted to painkillers, because you may start taking it for back pain. But if you haven't worked through your emotional, you know, your, your wounds, your childhood wounds and trauma, it feels really good. I mean, it feels better than good. And that's why people keep then taking pain pills and they get addicted to them because it, it's, a, it's, it's, um, 
suppresses the emotional pain as well. My, 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 my cousin, Patricia, who was very close to a taught metaphysics when I was a kid, and that's where I learned about it, so um, she completed suicide at 50, and she had just broken up with this man. Uh, she went through a divorce for after 30 years of marriage. She met this other guy, and he took advantage of her, and she put herself in a car and turned the gas on. That was it, and yeah, and uh, and she knew this, this stuff, yeah. yeah. It's emotional pain, for sure. I read recently, uh, Dr. Shirley, here that, that um, mostly it's the increase, really kind of scary, 70% increase since 2016 of young women to, between the ages of 10 to 16, 70% higher than 2016. Yeah, 10 to 19 years of age from 2010 to 2016, 70% higher, more women. Um, and the number one way they say is through firearms, mostly men firearms, women are mostly um, pills, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really interesting because they say uh, emotional pain, and number one, um, a breakup. A substance abuse, health crisis, financial, criminal legal problems, and then loss of housing, believe it or not. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, and it's, it's a lot of not know, you know, that um, a despair, such a huge, deep despair. Yeah. And, and having many, no hope. Right, right. And many times it's a fuck you to someone else. Yeah. Pardon and, my and, French. Do you guys curse on this show? Because yeah, we you did. Curse on the show yourself, but I, I, I told you that like minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, my, yeah, my brother-in-law, he, he was emotional. It was a, definitely get out of the pain. It was, and it was that, uh, was, F yeah, future, yeah family. Sure. A lot of times it is, you're right. A lot of times it is. It's, it can be. And, and how it's done it can also be that too. Right. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's dyadic in nature often. It's again, right. posing somebody else. Right. It can be. It doesn't have to be. Well, but it, it can, can be. be. It can be when it's done in a way where, um, where you know who's going to find you or you know you know and you hurt someone bad. intentionally right right because yeah, you also setting up karma you're setting up karma for future life hello right, right? you're setting right. up the karma well right. and it's also it's not knowing how to deal with emotions not knowing how you know particularly anger we have this idea in our society that anger is a four-letter word and it is such an important emotion to feel it's life force now how we deal with it the behavior of anger is very different but those are two separate things that many times get associated so then we become very afraid of anger Mm -hmm. You know, and, and suicide, depression is anger, you know, kind of turned, turned inwards. Inward. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's such an important thing to to reach out, like both of you have said, and of course I'm a huge proponent of it, you know, therapy and talk to someone and know that I you're not quite, And I have a question for you, Shirley. If, um, has, have you had clients who have attempted it and didn't, it didn't work, didn't go through? Have you ever had that experience? I have had clients yes. that have been close. But not not that have attempted, but that have been very. I had one jump out San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, and lived, and was very happy he lived. Um, and two, two others too that said they went someone it didn't work or something, and they were very they were both very happy that it didn't work. It's Can you imagine just that fall, just that fall alone, where they're still very conscious? Oh, I made a mistake. Oops, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah, and I'm all about you know at the end of my life if I'm not able to live a full life, I'm ready to go. You know, if that's fine, but. You know, it's funny, Brian and I talk about this. Well, make sure we have enough of the medication because you don't want to be like choking to death. You just want to go out. You know? <laughs> really? Well, I have to tell you, I mean, what you said, James, about quality of life is is true. There, okay. There's some people that are so afraid of death that, you know, would rather live regardless. And I'm on, I'm with you. It's quality of life because I think I never fully connected here. So I know, I, I, I think I know what the other side feels like. <laughs> That's why I want to show. <laughs> I mean, I would say this. I would say as a kid, don't celebrate my birthday, but if I die, have a huge party. As a little kid. Yeah. I'll analyze that later. But because, <laughs> well, because as you said, I mean, it's such an important message for, right. for listeners to know that the other side, it's not a punishing thing. It's no. not, I mean, I was brought up Catholic, so, it, you know, it's a sin and stuff, and it makes it even worse for people that feel so desperate and, so, and in so much despair to even say it, right. to even trust someone to to say anything. So guess what? We have Carrie Gonia yes. now. So let me Yay. explain Carrie Gonia. Yeah. Carrie is a family constellation facilitator and an intuitive. Guru, She's been doing family constellation, which you guys are going to hear about in a minute for 20 years. She's the best. You're going to love her. Welcome, Carrie Gonia. Hi. Oh, Hi, I'm Carrie. so happy to be here. Nice to meet you, Carrie. Nice to meet you. I've heard so many lovely things about you. 
<laughs> so sweet. You look like an alien, of course. <laughs> of course. I know. What's I mean, do any of us belong here? <laughs> no. I feel like I know no. you already. No. I, really do. I know. Okay, can I just say, though, those statistics are staggering. I got in right when James was talking about those statistics. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. A lot lately, but, you know, God only knows the society, too. Mm. Well, Gary, <sighs> tell us about Family Constellation and your thought and your point of entry into suicide. I don't know what that is, I don't have no idea what that is. So Family Constellation Therapy was started, he was actually a German psychologist. So it, it started, I think, around like the mid 90s. So he grew up in Nazi wartime Germany, really struggled in his youth with belonging and not knowing his place. And then he went to South Africa and studied with the Zulus for 20 years and figured out that they weren't struggling like we were. And so he kind of did all this research and he figured out that they, he was a family therapist, that they weren't struggling because they didn't, if somebody did something bad in the family system, they didn't kick them out. So they all worked together to honor the right to belong in the family. Everyone had balance. Everyone was equal. We, we obviously don't do that, especially historically, generationally. If you kill yourself, we don't talk about you. We have anger, we have shame. It's it's that way in family systems for addiction also. And so family constellation goes, I always tell people, it's, it's kind of a complicated theory, but it really goes to the heart of trauma, kind of unkinks those hoses where they've been kinked generationally and it gets you moving forward. Wow. Now so, say family constellation is like family ancestry, like it happens in one generation and the other generation, yep. the other generation. Okay. Yep. So it's it really goes to unkink the hose in terms of inherited generational trauma. So how it, many generations? Yeah. Sorry, Kelly. It it's funny. I feel like there. Uh, I feel like there's two camps for this. There's been a lot of data that has come out in the last couple of years where they've traced it seven generations. And then I've started to see articles, the more they learn about epigenetics, that it has been traced back to, to 14 generations. Wow. So typically in family constellation therapy, you'll work with the parents line, the grandparents line, sometimes the great grandparents if, you, if they were alive when you were born. And then not that often like fourth or fifth back. So you were telling me a story, I think it was yesterday, Carrie, a couple of days ago, where you had a client whose, grand, whose great-grandmother or somebody had completed suicide in a certain way, and that the other person, young, did the same thing. Like the Generations, huge generations difference. Yeah, it was two generations. So it was her great-granddaughter. This client came, she was in my office, she was telling me this wild story that it was kind of a fable in the family system. This great-grandmother got labeled crazy. She climbed up on this balcony in this gorgeous, affluent Victorian home, jumped off the balcony, drank a bunch of drink a bunch, took a bunch of pills, jumped off the balcony and died. And then two generations later, the granddaughter tried the exact same way, but wasn't successful, but did not connect the dots until I was like, huh, you just told me that story like 15 minutes ago. And so typically in my work, I'll see it at the same age, like the same age range. Wow. I mean, the, the energy carry through down the generations. Yeah. So the premise of my work is really about belonging everyone having a place in the family system. And so back then nobody talked about anything. So there were secrets that everything just got kind of swept under the rug. So that's what starts kinking those hoses. And also Carrie, I have a question for you. Yeah. They say yeah. that of course, um, like at certain addictions or certain, let's say health issues like diabetes or alcoholism goes through the family generations, goes to the family line. Would you say it's the same type of thing with suicide? It's funny, I watched the Hemingway documentary a couple years ago. I, I, I got the bullfighting, I could not go any further. I no. am so sensitive energetically. I was shocked that I was able to sit through it, but I have been fascinated by him. And there are, I believe there are seven or eight suicides in that family system. Yeah. Wow. But in the documentary, the granddaughter just kept saying, nobody talks about anything. Nobody witnessed the addiction, the war trauma, the pain, the whatever. And so it just, kept getting passed down and passed wow. down and passed down. Wow. Seven. So it seems like, you know, that, that, that famous saying, and forgive me, I'm paraphrasing, the sins of our father will be on the children. And, and, for, and I find that to be very, very true for the spirit world. And Kelly, we've talked about it. When the mother, let's say, won't forgive the drunk driver that killed the son and won't forgive, yes. the whole life won't forgive, that'll be passed on to the next generation. That sense of not yeah. forgiving, those lives will be blocked oh, energetically. Right. Somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, when you say constellations there, is it, from the constellations or why do you use that term? I, that's a great question. I actually don't know why he coined it family constellation oh, therapy. Okay. Yeah, he was doing family therapy for like 20 years. So uh, yeah, 
I don't, I mean, the practitioner works within a morphogenic field, okay. which is like the soul's consciousness within the family system. So that could be why. And how do you go through working with somebody, if I might ask, how like someone's in session with you? Like I'm going to have, how do you, um, how do you go about with the session? Just curious. Yeah. So predominantly it's done in big groups of people. So let's say we were doing a constellation on Shirley. Shirley would actually kind of sit on the sidelines and someone would stand in the space, someone who didn't know her and represent her mom, her dad, whatever she wanted to work on. And then she would actually be able to witness the constellation unfolding from like a different perspective. So I do, I obviously with COVID, we're all one-on-one, -on -one, but I do a lot of one-on-ones. And so when people used to come to my office, I would have all these different foam, mm -hmm. different colored foam feet, different sizes, different colors. And they would, I do blind constellations. So nobody knew what they were standing on. So if I put in your mom and your dad, you would just select two feet, you would open them and put them on the ground and then you would stand on them. And so once you're in the morphogenic field, I mean, it's not wild to us, but some wild stuff can happen. You I actually <laughs> yeah. had a session with Carrie and I had no idea what to expect. I didn't understand anything about this. Shirley just said, you have to have a session. And uh, I so, threatened you to an inch of your life. I think and I said, That's Kelly, exactly you right. So I'm in her office and I'm standing on these plastic shoes, not having a clue what I'm doing. You're like footprints. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Little and footprints. All of a sudden I fell to the side of the wall and I felt somebody had stabbed me in the back. And what had happened is my great grandfather had killed a Cossack and my father had a lot of issues with it. And it, the energy knocked me to the wall. Yeah. And that was just the first session. I had a second oh. session. And I still had more stuff to release. Yeah. But I'll tell you, it was a powerful. I'll never forget that as long as I live. But what it did for me is it allowed me to make the movements that I needed mm -hmm. to do in my life mm -hmm. to let go of a lot of things that I didn't know I was carrying. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Carrie, do you think that there are souls that come back? Obviously, I, I guess the answer is yes. That come back with their generational stuff, the trauma, and they they themselves come back in this lifetime to heal that soul group or that family trauma. They are the ones that chose to come back and heal it in this lifetime. I do. I'm I'm one of those people. Absolutely. Yeah. I how I knew I had spiritual gifts. I started dreaming about ancestors when I was like three or four, and they, they'd give me all this information. I'd go tell my parents back in the 70s, early 80s, it wasn't cool. So my parents were like, be quiet. And then I was just obsessed with family systems. And then when Family Constellation found me, everything made sense. And I was I was able to clear so much. I mean, I go to regular therapy too. I think that part's really important. I do somatic work, but FCT literally just kind of like Kelly, it just opened the floodgates and I, I really rushed forward when I started doing well, it's it. Because you came into your nature, your true yeah. nature, right? Yeah. Your nature. Look at your eyes, you're so psychic. Look at your yeah. eyes alone. <laughs> that, right? I know, James, yeah. I want to do a constellation for you. <laughs> I, love, I love it. I love it. I'm yeah. such a mess. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're going to be blown <laughs> away, James. And, and let me ask you this. If, if you, for instance, like let's say Kelly had that experience. And if you're the practitioner worked with her, would you pick things up that intuitively on top of what she's getting and you'd be able to tell her what's happening at that point? I do. I I feel like my connection to spirit really helps me with I don't I don't actually know a lot of family constellation facilitators. I've worked with a few that don't have that strong of a connection to the other side. And the ones that I have worked with that have a strong connection to the other side, I feel like I get so much more out of it. So there's a piece at the end. So like Kelly, can right. I use you as an example? Okay. So after Kelly had that experience, what happens is then I'll have the practitioner or I'll have the, the client actually turn and face the grandfather, whoever stabbed him, and really honor that trauma, witness that trauma. And so I actually just channel spirit. They tell me what to say. They call them healing statements or truth statements, and they're crazy accurate in family constellation yeah. therapy. So you just say short little choppy sentence sentences and that's when the hose on kinks and everything kind of comes up and out. That's exactly right. Yeah. And then regard to suicide and the emotional trauma. So suicide. So you have had experiences where clients have cleared past generations from suicide. And do they, and do they ever have reasons, what, what other reasons besides I mentioned emotional reasons or financial, any other reasons they completed the suicide that you found out in those generations or that we don't know of or I'm just curious. It's, I, that's a great question. I seem to attract a lot of addiction. There's a lot of addiction in the family systems, which it's just rampant kind of in our grandparents, parents' generation. Um, Alcohol, yeah. I actually read this really interesting New York Times article years ago where this this 
he, he was like 45, but when he was like four or five, he started having dreams about being in the Holocaust camps. And so he would have these night terrors and he didn't realize that, that he hadn't obviously been in the camps, but nobody in his family told him that his grandfather died in the camps. And so at 45, he subsequently killed himself because he just like was entangled in that trauma and nobody told him the truth. So I feel like my work is a lot about uncovering the secrets, you know. Wow. Well, Carrie, yeah. there's a question here. Valerie asks, can you break the attachment piece of the suicide in your family? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in my work, witnessing it, really witnessing it because there's so much anger and there's so much shame historically with, with suicide, you know. And so, again, it's like that energy just gets locked up and nobody talks about it and nobody honors what were they entangled with previously or what were they struggling with so i i think you can yeah yeah well and from a psychological standpoint it adds it now opens that up as an option when mm -hmm. there's suicide in the family system mm -hmm. all of a sudden it becomes an option so that's why it's not a you know it's not a coincidence that you know a great grandparent did it and then an uncle did it and so it opens up that option even even if you don't know about it almost from an energetic standpoint well, I mean, Melody here from Melody. I just want to respond to her comment. She talked about she's planning suicide when her husband when her husband goes and, and he knows about her or something and it's too much pain, so he's gonna go. I don't think that's the right reason to do a suicide because you're in pain. Because many times <clears throat> in this lifetime, the lessons that we go through in the, in the physical vibration, the three-dimensional world, are hard lessons. They're tough mm -hmm. ones. That's why we come back here to experience those hard ones, because it's really the hard ones, the painful ones that push us up, that really bring mm -hmm. out our, to our core, the, the goodness that we are, we look at ourselves. So suicide is really not an option when things get really hard on you emotionally, mm -hmm. things don't work out. It's really an incredible opportunity to grow. So people have to go beyond that. They've got to grow. So Melody, it's not a good reason just to do suicide when it gets hard. It's a, that's when you're learning the most. Yeah. That's why I jump in there. I always try and anchor with people too. Yes, we all come from trauma and inherited family system trauma, but we have strength, we have love, we have all their wisdom, we have all their guidance. And it's like tapping into that part is really important, especially right now. And, and Carrie, you know, what you said is so great. And it also goes to the point of, I like to look at things from a very different perspective, that the family that surrounds you, your ancestors who are really pulling for you in this lifetime and maybe yeah. you do things I couldn't do, I wasn't able to do. So I'm going to live through you and mm -hmm. they will push you to do things they weren't able to do in the lifetime, accomplishments yeah. they weren't able to, but you have the opportunities and they're in the side helping you to do that. Yeah. So they want you to succeed, but they couldn't perhaps. Yeah. I always tell people to honor them by having a big and beautiful and easy life. Like yeah. that's it. Just, you know, take steps towards that. I think you first yeah. got to love yourself and just honor what's what what's inside yeah. you and who you are and, mm -hmm. and not listen to anybody else about who you are, you know, yeah. who you are. Yeah. That's I think the first step. And not trying to get, you know, that being judged by others or listening to other people for you for honoring who you are. Mm -hmm. You gotta be who you are. Everybody is different. I, I believe everybody is like a, a snowflake. We're all unique. Mm -hmm. And when you have a lot of snow, as Kelly knows, you have a lot of snow, it's it looks snow. beautiful. It's a beautiful scene. That's the mm -hmm. world should be, the diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a great question here, and Roseanne uh, Rizzuto asked this. What age do you tell a child that a loved one committed suicide? Or I'm going to say completed suicide. What age would you – Shirley, what do you think on that? What's your thought? You know, that's a tough one. I don't, that's a tough one. I'm not trying to um, to work with kids in a therapeutic sit, uh, sitting. It's a tough one. You know, it depends on how you talk about the other side. You know, if you talk about the other side as, um, you know, they went to another side where people don't live with bodies, but they, you know, mm -hmm. so, so then you can explain it that way. And then when they're older and they have the maturity to, yeah. to understand mm -hmm. it because of all the energetic thing that Carrie and uh -huh. you've been talking about, it kind of adds it, that in. It might shock their system. So you really want to watch their right. system with that one. Mm -hmm. I would oh, say with that, with anybody, you guys, with anybody at that age, younger age, anybody who doesn't understand things, especially at that age, you, you really deliver to them in the age the, the way they'll understand it. So for, yeah. for a child, you say, you know, you go to dreamland at night. You go to dreamland. Well, they go to dreamland now and they're going to stay in the dreamland. And then we get older, just said, Kelly, then explain it to them. But yeah. some people understand that scare them, but just say they're exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think I think even the word child, I wouldn't say how the person yeah. passed on, yeah. you know, 
when they, you know, maybe at yeah. 18, 19, 20, when they're a little bit more mature, the teenage, you know, the adult brain doesn't come online until 25. Yes. So it's not the teenage, it's, you know, a little bit past the teenage as far as the connections, um, for the brain being fully connected. So yeah. unless they need to know for, I'm not sure what that reason would be, I wouldn't say how mm -hmm. they passed on. Right. Child. Yeah. I wouldn't go there. Um, <laughs> so one thing no, I do want to talk about. Can I ask you a question really quickly? Sure. Okay. So um, for suicide, the family's left behind or loved ones left behind. Um, what do you think as far as, um, I know there are some people, of course, dealing with grief, especially if it's a child that passes over, that they become professional grievers, right? Okay. As far as suicide, which is like I said before, it feels unnatural and they're filled with guilt and resentment. What do you suggest people do to honor that soul that did that? How should they behave the family in good. time when it goes a grieving process? Yeah, after and when you get through or you as you're grieving and getting through that, you know, set up a memorial. Set up a uh, a memorial is lovely. You know, a plant a, a rose bush. Mm -hmm. Go to their favorite place. Talk to them. They're there. As you said, send them a lot of love and start appreciating them for what they when they were here. Start really appreciating all the things that that you the experience that you had with them, the good experiences that you had with them they don't want you to remember that final moment they don't want they don't want to go there they really want to make sure that you know that they love you and they know you love them and and honor that i mean what do you think james i say exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Live, live the life that they want to live live yes. the, things they, the dreams they want to accomplish you can do that for them it's very important and, and carrie i have a question for you just popped in my head yes so along with your, your therapy work there um have you ever thought of people or have they ever done where they've taken photographs of all of generations before and they've put them out in their house or their, where they live and they speak to them or they forgive them or they, they have that relationship then with them. Is that, they've done that before? Yeah, actually why I was late was I was just in a constellation and I kept feeling like she was named after somebody and I kept getting this name, Grandma Pearl. And she was like, but I said, it's your great grandma. And she was like, oh yeah, that was my great grandma on my dad's side. She raised my dad. And then she, I was like, but somebody's missing, somebody's missing in the family system. And so the grandmother's sister had passed at like seven or nine, but they named this girl after the, the great aunt, but never told her. And so she said she used mm. to dream about her when she was little. And then I was like, hey, what trauma happened bet between seven and nine with you? And then her parents got divorced. She suffered this massive loss. Well, this, the great aunt died at seven, seven to nine. She got sick at seven, died at nine. So I was like, same thing get a get a photo write a letter like really honor them so i have clients that set up altars after doing yeah. constellation therapy and it's crazy it's so beautiful to watch how quickly their life moves forward just by witnessing oh you were here you were in the family like having that love mm. they call, in my work they call it orders of love like having that flow restored because then they don't have to keep looking backwards they actually get to to look forward so it's really common in my work, which is yeah, beautiful. It sounds beautiful. Yeah. All right. Wow. Well, if anybody wants to work with the three of us, we <laughs> are Shirley and Carrie and I are doing a webinar on are May. You? We are. It's on May 22nd. <laughs> it's called Healing Roots, Healing Your Roots. And I'm going to be talking about it from a spiritual standpoint of why did you incarnate? I'm going to talk about spiritual contracts, sacred contracts. Uh, with our family and our loved ones and Shirley what are you going to be discussing during this seven hour webinar talking about how the plants of self-esteem the seeds of self-esteem get planted you know our inner child and what happens in the the attachment how important that attachment connection is and um how to start to heal those uh -huh. from childhood on right mm -hmm. yeah yeah because you know the brain develops from zero to five so it's, you know, the cliche again is to blame our parents, but who you're mostly with from zero to five when the brain is developing. So it's not about blame. It's about understanding. I'll never forget the day I understood myself. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference on attachment and he was describing this type of attachment connection and he was describing me. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't take enough information about it. And I finally understood myself and I went, oh, and then I could heal it. Wow. You know, so that's the piece I'll be talking about. 
And Carrie, what are you going to be talking about during this fabulous <laughs> webinar? I love that part, Shirley, because that's how I felt with family constellation therapy. I thought, mm -hmm. like, I felt the second I stepped into my parents' shoes, I was like, oh, my whole life makes sense. <laughs> so <laughs> I am going to be geeking out about all things family systems. So I will be diving into the how, the what, the who, the when, and definitely giving people tips and tricks to start kind of unkinking that hose. Oh my God. You're gonna and we're going to do gonna, a healing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm going to do a group yes. family. I'm going to do a group constellation. I wait. I cannot yeah. wait. May 19th, you said? You, you, of course, you could take I'm it. I'm dropping in. Are you kidding? Are you <laughs> yes. Yay. Yes. Yay. You're going to love it, James. It's going to be great. And I geeked out with spirituality. So it's it's funny. It's oh, yeah. all passions. Yeah. We're the Charlie's Angels of Healing. I'm convinced. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's right, James. You're Charlie. Yeah. Yes. And then yeah. actually you can go to my website, but it shouldn't be Kelly. It's K-E-L-L-E-E -E -E com healing. So Renee, it's, uh, it's called Roots of Healing and it's, uh, you can find it on Facebook. You can find it on Instagram and you can find it on my Facebook, but it's Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-E -E -E, uh, right. White. Yeah. I'm E-E. Oh, there she is. There is Kelly White. Mm -hmm. There you go. I never so, realized that it Lee, it's, Lee, L-E-E, -E, yeah. because of your dad. That's his name. Talk about family constellations. Oh, we I didn't, didn't notice that on about that. Yeah, it was my dad's dad who actually, his brother, did this, you know, killed a Cossack. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole deal there. Well, Kelly. Oh, yeah. oh Kelly, by the way. And, and I really have my yoga instructor. I'm a brand new yoga instructor, but another K-E-L-L-I. Every single spelling of Kelly's are in my life. Kelly's wow. O'Brien. It's the weirdest thing. That's so yeah, it's the weirdest, weirdest thing. thing. And I'm going to be doing this Friday a demonstration uh, this Friday night uh, at six o'clock right here. At, well, on my website, vetprog.com. Oh, and um, mediumship one for people that are interested in signing up May 19th. Um, I'll put from now until May 19th. And that's it's filling up. Um, there's going to be a limited amount of people, but uh, you can sign up also to JVP School of Mystic Arts. Oh, here we go. Online evening of spirit this Friday and uh, vetprog.com. And then if you want to go to the JVP School of Mystic Arts, you can sign up for the mediumship one class, which I only offer every two years, two to three years. Mm -hmm. So I'll never forget when I started to uh, tag along with Kelly. When she started to work and with you me. Were good. Oh you my were so good. God. I said, Girly, you're a Pisces. Now come on. You're like, I yeah. can't, I can't, my left brain does not work with the right brain. You can do it, so Go to the right brain. Go to the right brain. It's okay. I know. You know what, though? I think. I, I don't have, I like being intuitive. I don't have an interest in that. I think I was killed in a past life and I just, it, it kind of scares me a little. To, to oh, you, you were, you were killed for, maybe you were killed for your belief system. Because yes, a lot of yes. Killed. But, a lot of oh my oh. God, blown away so many times. I have so many like distinct, and my memory isn't great. They'll, <laughs> Carrie and Kelly will vouch for that. But some distinct memories of when you would, you know, channel, I guess, a, uh, um, you brought through spirit one. incredibly well. And oh my, and the healing. I mean, I could visibly, since I do the somatic work, I can visibly see the people just, and their body would just calm and relax in getting that message. And I just thought, oh, this is so powerful. I loved it. And I remember I looked and said, hello. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, we had so much fun and we were talking about cruises. Carrie, you're going to have to come with us. Oh, uh, so Carrie, you, oh, you got to uh, go with us. We're so so going to Greece next, next year when it opens up. We'll do Greece. I can't uh, wait. This is a great up. question, everybody. It's from Joanne Wilson. How do we forgive ourselves for having suicidal thoughts? Oh. Well, the question Therapist? is, do we have to? I think it's more understanding. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. When we use the word forgive, that means that, that that implies that it's something bad or wrong. And I think it's more understanding why. Be curious about why did that thought come up. I think almost everyone has had a suicidal yeah. thought, even if it's a light one, like I'd rather not be here or this is, you know. Um, so I think it's understanding, not forgiving. But, but because there's it's also, a, Shirley, when you think it's also in a way suicide because it's ending. It's change. It transitions. It's endings. And we all have thoughts about things ending, new phases coming in, yeah. new waves coming in, waves go out, and things move. Life is about movement. And things are always changing and always moving. So, suicide is just something ending. Um, you know, it'll still continue. People think suicide is the end. It will. It'll continue on the other side. Mm -hmm. Won't be as easy, probably, but you'll continue still having those th thoughts, and you don't get it's, away from yourself. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's a curiosity of what feels so bad or so insurmountable or so overwhelming that I had this thought. So be curious and that lends itself to self-compassion as well. 
Yeah. And that's really what, where all healing becomes comes from is self-compassion. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw something out here too. And it's just a theory I have, and I don't know if it's, I don't know what's right. I just like, like everyone to comment on it. Um, I think, I don't know that the soul, when they go through life, there are some times when something happens in their life and maybe they get sick or they get a headache or something happens with part of their body or they can't breathe or something. I often think that that's a soul memory that in a past life, they would have passed at that time, maybe from being choked or hung, maybe from drowning. And they, oh. the soul kind of remembers at that age. Is that kind of yeah. weird, Carrie? Have you heard anything like that? It's kind of. Yes. So I feel like that's similar to to family constellation therapy because, like, I can use myself as an example. My gifts always felt like life or death to me. Huh. Like, it really felt like if I come out of the closet, I am going to be whacked instantly and it, yeah. there were a lot of, I knew, grew up with my dad's side but I didn't grow up with my mom's side and then I found out much later in life that my grandmother was incredibly incredibly intuitive and they told her she was crazy they did all this really gnarly shit to her and so but it was like the same ages where I started to like have that constriction in my body so in family system I can in family systems intergenerationally I can sometimes see it Mm -hmm. at very specific points that mirror somebody that came before. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because when I do my uh, workshops and with people, I do past life regression sometimes mm -hmm. and on, on the mediumship course and people get afraid of the mediumship sometimes because, um, and we find that in the past life again, Kelly, because they mm -hmm. died for their belief system. They yeah. were yeah. into spiritualism or they, yeah. and they died for it because the religious yeah. time, so that soul memory continues on. Yeah. The yeah. trauma, yeah. if you will, yeah. soul trauma. Well, it's like a cellular imprint. Shirley, I love that you talked about like suicide, having that door open. I think of that with Hemingway. It's like that imprint in the genetic biome is bananas. I mean, seven or eight of them, you know? So I feel that way about past life stuff too, until you clear it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And how do you through an imprint, Shirley? How do you do that? How do you clear the imprint? Do you just go in there and unwind it all or? Well, that's where I think you guys come in as far as from an energetic standpoint, from a somatic standpoint, you'll see if that imprint, you know, has created any kind of feelings in your body or any kind of pains in your body or any kind of, could be that, you know, from an energetic standpoint, it's also translating into a physical standpoint. So maybe you have stomach pains and you find out that someone committed suicide through a knife in their stomach or got killed mm -hmm. that way or something and so so we take the time to just notice the sensation even if it's pain and just observe it and see what happens next and the most amazing things happen next that can heal that so so let me just bring this one step further because my mind is thinking always and kelly you might have dealt with this that someone um we're all one we're all connected so someone in your family and generation for suicide but is it maybe a part of you also that was in that soul right because we're all part of each other and how do we not know that there's an aspect or part of the great great grandparent that we still carry with us that memory that's that we experienced that in that lifetime i don't know there's something i think about that we're you know why separate it so much mm -hmm. it could be all part yeah. of mm -hmm. the soul yeah Mm -hmm. Just an interesting thought, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we think this world, this three-dimensional world of separation is the biggest illusion we have is separation and death. Yeah. Two biggest illusions. Mm -hmm. There is no separation. We're all connected as one, but the illusions are separate. Yeah. But even as souls, you know, we're part of each other. And I don't know, when we say people say with suicide, you know, or, or the other side, how do you speak with them if they're reincarnated? Well, there's an aspect of part of that soul that you knew, the personality you knew here in the earth still exists on another level. But also maybe like us, most of who we are is outside the body. Only 40% mm -hmm. is in the body. Most of our souls outside the body experiencing different worlds, different things. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Just an interesting thought that I had that maybe we we are part of that whole situation of those generations and those traumas. And it makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it does. Oh, it right does. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> unbelievable um <laughs> thank you everybody for listening thanks, and everyone. thank you shirley and thank you carrie oh, well, thank you thanks, carrie. Thanks, shirley. really thanks, everybody carrie. join us on may nice 22nd you, it was lovely to meet you this is and great we'll see, we'll see you may 19th <laughs> exact may 22nd and you'll be busy on april 30th this friday so yes yeah, it's friday my demo yes i want to get tickets please go to website Okay, Take thanks care, everyone. Everybody. Bye. 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 You've been listening to Both Sides Now and Beyond, featuring spiritual medium and master teacher. 
James Van Prague, and spiritual medium and psychotherapist Kelly White. The James and Kelly Show.